All right, first I'm going to say, what is the Earth Radiation Budget, or ERB, and why is it important? I give a brief history of, uh, of Nimbus. Uh, the Nimbus 6 and 7, what was new and different about that? Primary results from the Nimbus 6 and 7. A comparison to the ERBI, which is Earth Radiation Budget Experiment, as opposed to ERB. Uh, that was after Nimbus. And some conclusions. All right. What is the Earth Radiation Budget, for those who don't know? Um, here is a diagram showing the globe as a whole averaged over the entire year. And the, th the 342 watts per meter squared of incoming solar radiation on the average. And you can see what's happening. It's uh, scattering off of clouds. It's uh, scattering from the Earth. It's being absorbed by the surface of the Earth. It's being emitted. There's a whole lot of things going on, as you can see. But the main thing is, if you look at the 107 watts per meter squared going out from reflected radiation and the 235 outgoing, if you add those two numbers, it adds up to 342, which would imply a net radiation of zero, which would mean no global warming. Not true. Um, there, it, there is global warming. But uh, this diagram doesn't really show it, but it's, uh, it's, it's different from this. Uh, now, why is the Earth radiation budget important? First of all, it's a driver in the Earth's weather and climate, as we will see. Accurate data on Earth is important to weather and climate models. And the net surplus and deficit of Earth will tell us where the Earth is warming or cooling. Global warming doesn't mean the whole globe is warming. I think you all know that here. Um, but some of it is warming in certain places, and it's cooling in others. But on the average, it's warming. Here is uh, a slide I got from uh, Professor Vandahar, who gave this talk 40, uh, 10 years ago. And he said that I could use anything of his slides. And I uh, would uh, gladly uh, use some of it. But here is one of his that he presented, still uh, uh, meaningful. It's the radiation budget at the top of the atmosphere, annual radiation budget. See, as a function of latitude. And it shows uh, a surplus of radiation in the tropical area. Oop, I didn't want to do that. Oop. All right, let me go forward. All right. Uh, a surplus of radiation in the tropics and a deficit outside that. Um, and you can see here the amount and space time distribution is a fundamental driver of the Earth's weather and climate because of that surplus and deficit. It's got to go somewhere. All right, here is an early history of measuring the Earth's radiation budget. During the 1960s, Tyros and the first experimental US Air Force sun synchronous satellite gave us early low resolution view of the Earth's radiation budget. And I have a quote here I want to read from Von Harn Sumi. It said, we found that the Earth was a warmer and darker planet than previously believed, especially in the tropical region. We found that 40% more energy must be transported poleward by the atmosphere and ocean circulations. That's, that's dramatic. And if true, we could better understand and model atmospheric and oceanic circulations, air-sea interactions, and both the Earth's energy and water cycles. We could do a whole lot better. All right, a brief history of Nimbus Earth, going before the Earth Radiation Budget Experiment itself from Nimbus 6 and 7 that I was involved in. The Nimbus two and three medium resolution infrared radiometer experiments 
um, or he had adimbus six and seven herb results, they were designed to check, verify, and expand the results from these early 1960s. And the Nimbus II medium resolution experiment was unfortunately short, but did provide the first medium resolution herb measurements over the polar regions. Now the Nimbus III medium resolution was a great success. And more than a year of pole to pole, local noon midnight herb was obtained at medium spatial resolution. Great success. Now, many regional features were explored uh, that we didn't have before as much. Uh, ocean, stratus regions, uh, major deserts, Amazonia. You can see seasonal variations over the continents. Uh, and you could read this for yourself. Uh, and uh, significant differences over the Arctic and Antarctic. Now, because the early Nimbus MRIR used five spectral bands to estimate the total Earth radiation and reflected radiation, it did not measure the direct solar radiation or solar irradiance. And so a more complete herb measurement package was developed for Nimbus 6 and 7. So with the Nimbus 6 and 7 era, uh, Bill Smith, who was here, was the principal investigator. I worked with him, and um, we had uh, a number of others, Don Hillary, John Hickey, Bob Mashoff, Lee Kyle, and others, who developed an eclectic experiment for both Nimbus 6 and 7 had low resolution fixed radiometers, and we had, and this is very significant, medium resolution biaxial scanners. And what I mean by that, it would scan, we had four shortwave channels and four infrared channels that would scan to the horizon and then come back. We would actually move over to try to fill in the spaces and then scanned back to the nadir, and then made a 90-degree rotation, and then scanned, didn't go all the way to the horizon. There were some difficulties there in, in designing that, but we went almost to the horizon, and scanned back, and then did another 90-degree. So you could get in all different directions. That was very significant. The other very significant thing was we had 10 spectral bands measuring the direct solar irradiance, including the total um, solar irradiance reaching the Earth. Now, the Nimbus 6 results were good, yet they revealed some challenging data processing and analysis questions. So this led to the Nimbus 7 herb science team. Um, I was the team leader, and you can see the names here, Garrett Campbell, Lee Kyle, Kim Coulson of UC Davis, Mashoff of Golden, Fred House, Drexel, Larry Stowe, Andy Ingersoll, Caltech, Tom Vondahar, CSU, Al Arking, and Ben Dean were NASA project scientists. Now, Bill Smith was involved, as you heard, in pioneering new weather observations for Nimbus, so he could not take a direct uh, part in the team. Uh, we would have loved to have had him, but he can't be everywhere. Now, our primary results from the Nimbus 6 and 7 herb were that we produced the first high precision measurements of the direct solar irradiance reaching the Earth. The first. And we actually beat out the Solar Max mission, which was designed to be more accurate. Uh, I mean, it was special, and I'll show you something about that. But it helped check and improve early climate models. That was an important thing. Now, here is a, uh, a, a picture of solar irradiance. The top part is the Nimbus 7 herb, and you can see the, the solar cycle, the sunspot cycle, the solar cycle, how it varies. And here is the Solar Max mission. 
we actually beat them by six months. We know that they are more accurate. And down here is the follow-on to the Nimbus, the Earth Radiation Budget uh, Satellite uh, uh, experiment. And uh, so we have uh, a good record of the solar irradiance. Now, this diagram shows something different going away from the solar. This is the um, measurements of the variations of the outgoing infrared radiation over the globe for this, in this particular one, June, July, and August. And the top one is the CCMI, the CCM1, rather, cl uh, climate model. And the bottom one is the number seven. And what we're talking about is the standard deviation. Uh, for those who don't know, it's, the, it's a measure of the variation of the radiation, at, of the outgoing long ray radiation. The higher the standard deviation, the greater the variation from its mean. So what you'll notice dramatically, if you compare these numbers, uh, you will see um, that there are the standard deviation in many places, on the average, is about twice as much in the models than you see with the uh, measurements from the Earth radiation budget. So uh, as a result, the models had to be revised considerably, and they were greatly improved and, uh, until they got something of the order of what we actually measure. So that was an important thing. Another thing I want to show, uh, the follow-on to the Nimbus uh, 7 herb was the, uh, the Earth Radiation Budget Experiment, ERBE. And uh, this was the herbs part of that the no on NOAA 9. And I want to compare uh, the, a four-month average, this particular uh, figure, and I have it circled. Uh, the, they came out with 234.50 watts per meter squared for the outgoing. And the Nimbus 7 wide field of view had 234.88, pretty close. Also close on the albedo, the percent reflected uh, of, from the, of the solar radiation. 29.89 here, 29.88 here. So uh, excellent. And the Irby was the follow-on, which then led to the series, Climate and Earth's Radiation Energy System, I believe it's. So I have some conclusions. The Nimbus Herb results confirmed and greatly expanded our knowledge of the fundamental Earth science parameters. It also provided a baseline for the outgoing ongoing monitoring of the Earth's climate system from space. It also guided development of global models and international climate experiments such as GWEX. And it led to the highly successful NASA herbs and series programs to continue the expansion of knowledge for climate purposes. But one last thing I want to say, I meant to say it before, when I was talking about the uh, science team that we had, um, and this is a, uh, a happy reminiscence of uh, that time, uh, we had a number of uh, team members, and every three months we would go to meet at one of their locations, be it Caltech or uh, UC Davis, different places, and you know. After a while, you come in the evening, um, you go to dinner, and it's, you know, you're not in a, as friendly a surroundings as you would like. So I discussed this with my wife, and she said, why don't you have them all over to the house for dinner when we were, at, when we were meeting in, in, in Maryland? I said, great idea. And she prepared a, a, 
dinner, a buffet dinner that we could take and they could all come and meet. And I remember that my two daughters were very young at the time and they came down and said good night to the team members. And I, you know, I remember this very fondly. And she, and uh, we even set up an easel that we, my daughters would use for doing a little painting. And we used that and had some discussions, very relaxed, and had dinner and a much better surroundings than we would have in a, uh, a more formal setting. So I remember that very well. So that's what I take away from it personally, uh, besides the conclusions that the success of the Nimbus 6 and 7 radiation budget uh, provided. And I thank you.